Hi clinicians, my name is Emily Dubas and I'm a speech language pathologist and the clinical services and education manager at The Learning Corp. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Insights on Outcomes of Technology-Based Treatment for Aphasia. Here are my speaker disclosures. I am an employee of The Learning Corp, which makes the Constant Therapy app, and I have no relevant non-financial relationships. Here are today's learning objectives. We are going to look at research using technology in aphasia rehab. Then we'll talk about four key factors that influence technology-based therapy outcomes, and then we'll connect these factors to clinical practice. So with that, let's get started. This talk is going to focus specifically on one systematic review for aphasia rehab, but I do want to take a moment to mention that there's many systematic reviews out there examining both cognitive and language rehab. And since we're going to focus the majority of this talk on aphasia, I wanted to mention briefly one review that looked at cognitive linguistic rehab. This is a well-known systematic review by Cicero et al., with the most recent one published in 2019 and they've evaluated 491 papers, and with that, they've made recommendations for evidence-based cognitive rehab. So one trend is that the use of technology in rehabilitation has grown considerably over the years, and because of that, the authors have incorporated the use of technology into four different domains, and that includes language and communication, attention, memory, and visuospatial functioning. So why technology? Well, it's so much a part of people's daily lives, so it makes sense that it's a functional part of the recovery process as well. And research really shows the importance of intensive and ongoing therapy, but there can be some barriers that impact individuals from accessing services on an ongoing basis. And so some of those barriers include shorter lengths of stay, limited therapy time or insurance coverage, difficulty with transportation, or scheduling constraints from the client and the clinician, as well as client and caregiver fatigue. On the flip side, technology can help address some of these limitations. We already discussed how it's functional and a part of people's daily lives, but it's also very accessible and flexible, so people can engage anytime and anywhere that they choose. Programs can be very engaging and dynamic and objective, so individuals can track their progress over time. And it can also keep the clinician involved as well, and clinicians can stay linked and see you know, what, the, what their patients are doing on these programs to help support and supplement their, their recovery. And so for the rest of today's webinar, we're going to be looking specifically at a systematic review by DeRoche and Kiran. It was published in 2017, and they reviewed 31 studies that provided technology-based language or language and cognitive rehabilitation. Here are some examples of some programs that were in this review. And out of the programs, some focused on a specific skill area and others spanned multiple skill areas. So we'll take a look at some of the different studies that were in included in this review. Let's first take a look at some studies that focus on a single domain, and that's reading. And you can see the studies here on the right-hand side. And the first one we'll talk about is by Cherney in 2010. And they were looking at the oral reading for language and aphasia program, in other words, ORLA. And just briefly, the protocol of ORLA is on the left-hand side of the screen. This originally was done in clinic, so in person with a clinician. And in the protocol, the client will listen to a sentence while reading silently as the clinician reads it aloud. Then they'll read the sentence aloud in unison, then the clinician will identify words in the sentence that are read aloud by the clinician, and then the clinician will point to words in the sentence and the client will read those, those words aloud. Finally, they'll read the sentence aloud in unison again. For the in-person ORLA, research showed very good outcomes, not just in reading comprehension, but also in verbal expression, written expression, and auditory comprehension. And so what this study set out to do was look at in-person ORLA versus a computer-based ORLA program. So participants received 24 sessions of ORLA one to three times per week, either by computer or in person. And you can see the findings in the iPad there. Both computer ORLA and SLP ORLA were effective. 
and that low intensity computer based Orla for chronic non fluent aphasia is efficacious and may be equivalent to Orla delivered by an SLP. Here's another study that looked at reading, and this was by Katz and Wirtz. And this is an older study, but I do want to mention it because it was a very comprehensive program. So they looked at 55 people living with aphasia, and these individuals were randomly assigned into three different groups. They either received no treatment, computer stimulation, which was nonverbal or cognitive games, or a computer reading treatment. And here's an example of the different types of exercises that were in the reading program. And so you can see there were things um, on the lower end, like letters and numbers and words, all the way through more complex activities like complex comprehension and complex reading. And so it was a very comprehensive program. Language measures were administered in three and six months post. And they found that the no treatment group did not show any gains on language measures. The computer stimulation group showed gains on one measure and the computer reading group showed gains across five measures. So the results suggest that the reading treatment group on the computer can be administered without minimal assistance from a clinician and that improvement on computerized reading treatment tasks generalized to non-computer language performance. And so one thing to mention with both of these studies is that both of these are computer-based treatments that were administered outside of the clinic and something that the patients could be working on with minimal clinician assistance. And so that's actually really good news uh, for the clinician. If this can be administered outside of therapy sessions, then this is going to free up time in the clinic for us to be working on other things. Language is a complex skill, and so there's certainly no shortage of things to be working on in the clinic. Now let's look at another domain, sentence processing and production. And here are the studies that were discussed in the review. And the study we're going to be looking at is by Cherney, Kay, and Van Vieren. They looked at an intensive computer-based script training program under two different uh, queuing conditions, high cues or low cues. So this program has three parts. First, they listen silently to the whole conversation. Then the individual will repeatedly practice each turn of the conversation. First, they'll do it in unison with the virtual clinician, and then they'll do it independently. And then the entire conversation is rehearsed while taking turns with that digital therapist. And so this is a screenshot of one uh, script training practice from the program. Here are the findings from the study. There were significant gains in acquisition and maintenance at three and six weeks post-treatment. And they also found that both queuing conditions were effective, but the high queue condition may be advantageous for those with more severe aphasia. And so that's another important takeaway um, when you're considering different technology-based programs for your patients is that some individuals might need um, some additional assistance or some cues that are built in. And so determining if that program uh, that you're considering also has some cues that will help assist uh, some individuals. Looking at another domain, writing, uh, here are some of the studies that were covered in this review. And this is one study by Laganaro et al. And they uh, looked at outcomes with a written computerized picture naming treatment uh, when intensity was varied. And the authors defined intensity in terms of number of items. So this had, the study had eight people with aphasia. And in group A, the, that group got a lower intensity therapy first in phase one. So they had daily therapy session, and then they practiced 48 words for homework on the computer. And the homework session lasted between 30 and 60 minutes. Then in phase two, they got the daily therapy session, but the word list doubled for homework. So they were working on 96 words. And then in group B, the intensity flipped. So the, um, they got the more intensive treatment first, and then the less in intensive treatment second. So the results were very interesting. They found that both groups showed improvement. However, there was significantly greater improvement on the larger set, even though these items received less exposure during treatment. And so this suggests uh, the importance 
of greater intensity, not only providing more repetitions, but also exposure to a higher number of items as well. Let's move along to look at some studies that had programs that spanned language in multiple domains. And here are some examples of the different studies here. Here's a study that was included in the systematic review by Choi et al. And they had an iPad program that spanned six different domains, and those were auditory comprehension, reading comprehension, repetition, naming, writing, and verbal fluency. And so within each of those domains, there was a hierarchy of tasks uh, and multiple levels of difficulty. As far as outcomes, there were improvements on the KWAP. There was also maintenance and a one-month follow-up. And they found that age and time post onset were not significant predictors of outcomes and that people at any age or chronicity were showing improvements and that improvements were also associated with usage time of the program, so how much they were practicing. There were other programs discussed in the systematic review that spanned language in multiple domains as well as cognition. And so here are the list of the different studies that were included in this review. We are going to discuss a few of these studies. And the first one is by Wenke et al. And this was a really interesting study because they were looking at different service delivery models and they were doing a cost analysis to see what the cost effectiveness was in terms of um, cost versus outcomes. So there were two groups. The standard service group was kind of usual care where they got three hours of therapy per week for eight weeks. And then the other group was more intensive. So they had a daily SLP session, and then they got one of three additional options. And so that was either a supplemental uh, treatment session with a speech pathology assistant, or group therapy, or computer-based treatment. And here are the results. So as far as standardized measures, both service models showed statistically significant improvements between pre and post treatment. And there was also high satisfaction ratings uh, from participants, caregivers, and clinicians across the three different intensive models. And then looking at the cost effectiveness, this chart here looks at the cost per hour of treatment. And you can see that the SLPA treatment was the most expensive followed by the standard service, which was $56 per hour. Then the computer therapy was 41, and the group therapy was $39 per hour. And so the findings were that this pro rata cost of treatment per hour per client was considerably less for the computer and the group therapy models, and that participants received more therapy hours per every dollar spent in those two groups. Let's take a look at another study by DeRoche et al. And they were looking at the effectiveness of incorporating an iPad into therapy. They, had, um, they looked at 51 participants with aphasia. The control group got an in-clinic visit once per week, and the experimental group got an in-clinic visit once per week, and then they were given constant therapy to be using as a home program. In terms of results, the homework users showed greater accuracy and latency within the constant therapy tasks. And then outside of the program, they showed more significant changes on standardized tests. And that includes the WAB and the Clicket. And you can see the statistical significance um, shaded in a darker purple there. Here's another study that incorporated the use of the iPad for both language and cognition in an intensive comprehensive aphasia program. So this study included 20 people with aphasia who got intensive therapy across disciplines. And you can see the SLP treatment, there were um, individual, dyadic, group, and community outings. On the right-hand side, you can see the different ways that they used the iPad, including therapy apps, non-therapy apps, built-in iPad apps, they used the iPad for homework, and in, in their group therapy, they also did general education on how to use the iPad. Here's an example of a homework sheet for one of the participants where they used an app called Pictello to practice their speech. Um, they practiced tasks on constant therapy, and then they also picked which app they wanted to use to uh, help with reading or listening to an audiobook. 
In terms of the findings, they found that the use of the iPad for materials was more efficient and cost effective. They also found that step-by-step -step handouts for each new app and multiple opportunities to practice in the clinic with the clinician helped increase the independence of the iPad uh, use outside of the clinic. And finally, further assignments ensured more independent practice uh, and more independence outside of the sessions. Authors also found statistically significant improvements on functional and quality of life measures. And then also uh, subjectively, the family members and participants reported more confidence in social situations, they used language more spontaneously at home, and they showed to have more improved communicative effectiveness. So far, we've talked about a lot of different studies, and so just I want to take a moment to recap. We first talked about a number of different studies that focused on language in a single domain. Then we talked about studies looking at language in multiple domains. And then finally, studies that covered both language and cognitive domains. So now that we've explored some of the research using technology in aphasia rehab, we're going to move on to the next two learning objectives. And so we'll cover both of them simultaneously. In their review, DeRoche and Kiran identified four factors that influenced rehab outcomes for people with aphasia. And so these four factors are personalization, intensity, homework, and cost effectiveness. And so we'll discuss each one as well as their application to the clinic. The first factor is personalization. So in the review, there were some studies that were very standardized. So regardless of age or severity or chronicity, everyone got the same treatment. And there were other studies that had uh, more personalization to the program. And what they found was that individualizing treatment showed greater overall gains across the range of outcome measures. So when thinking about personalization and its application to clinical practice, we know that therapy is not a one-size-fits-all type of deal. And because of that, there's you know, many programs out there, um, and some might be a, a good fit for one and may not be a good fit for the other. And so it's important as a clinician to be evaluating these programs and how they can be uh, you know, used effectively with each of your clients. So questions that you might want to ask are, um, you know, how can I be involved in this program? Does this program allow for the clinician to be involved in making adjustments in that personalization? Can the programs be personalized based on the client's therapy goals, based on their interests? If a client has feedback about the program, can that feedback be incorporated into the personalization process? And also, what cues do the programs have? We talked about one study that looked at both a high cue versus a low cue condition, and they found that people that were more severe um, benefited from the higher cue condition. So you also want to think about that as well. Does that program that you're considering have the type of cues that would be effective for that individual to be more successful outside of the clinic. And then it's also um, important to consider the barriers to personalizing programs. And one food for thought as well is there might be some ways to personalize a program that you might not be familiar with. And so also contacting that company or that technology and asking those questions about personalization can be a good learning experience and might uh, uncover some different ways that that a program can be personalized. The second factor is intensity, and technology can be a fantastic way to increase intensity because it's so accessible and flexible, and so it allows for individuals to, um, to use it more often and, and more intensively. And uh, one study that we've discussed today by Laganaro et al., they talked about intensity in terms of the number of items completed. But there's many ways that you can interpret intensity. Uh, other ways to interpret it is by the number of treatment sessions per week, or the length of the sessions, the total number of treatment sessions, the total number of exercises that are completed in a session, or even the amount of supplemental homework. So in terms of application to clinical practice, technology can be a really great way to increase the intensity of practice. One thing to consider is a common barrier is waxing and waning motivation. So 
I know I felt this way with learning a new skill and you might feel this way as, as well. When you first get started, you might be really motivated and be practicing intensively, but over time that motivation might wax and wane. And so one way that you can try to keep that intensity up is by varying those different parameters that we discussed. So for example, Perhaps the client first is trying to get to X number of items in a session before they stop practicing. And then if that becomes a little bit more dull, maybe they then try to work, do X number of sessions within a week, or they try to do X number of minutes of therapy each week. So you can kind of play with those parameters to keep you motivated over time. Another thing that might help with keeping that intensity up is rationale building. Um, so, you know, teaching your clients about the importance of practice, the importance of intensive therapy, and how practice and intensive practice can help, um, you know, change the brain and change the way that the connections are working in the brain. So the third factor is homework. And this really goes hand in hand with intensity, where doing homework can help increase that practice and increase the intensity of practice. There was one study that took a look at outcomes when individuals were given homework, and that was by DeRoche et al. You can see the chart below. This is where the control group did not get homework, and the experimental group weren't given requirements about how long they should spend, but on average, they were voluntarily spending over four hours on the program per week. And so that's four times more opportunity to be practicing those skills. So considerations for clinical practice. We already talked about how homework can provide more intensive and consistent practice, but it can also increase independence and autonomy over their own rehabilitation. It can help generalize the skills that you're working on in the clinic to other environments, and it gives the individuals tools that they can be practicing in between sessions as well as after discharge so they can continue to maintain or improve those skills even after they're, they're done with their therapy. So going over the importance of practice and the benefits of homework with the patient can really help you know, build rationale and build understanding about um, why it's important to be doing the, the homework in between sessions. Of course, there's going to be individuals who are not compliant with homework. Um, we've all encountered that as well, and that can definitely be a struggle for some. And the reason why they're not compliant can be multifactorial. There can be a lot of reasons why. And so that's an important thing to kind of dig into with your, with your patients uh, if they're coming in and they're not doing their homework. So some things to, to ask and to kind of dig into are, um, you know, what is their comfort level like with the device that they're on? Perhaps there's something, you know, just a barrier that's even uh, preventing them from opening up the programs that you're recommending. It could be comfort level with the program as well. Um, so you might need to sit down and kind of observe how they're using the program and that might reveal some really interesting learnings that you can go over with them in the clinic. It might be that the program isn't a good fit for them and they might need to, you know, try, try something else or try, try a different approach. It could be that the exercises are either too easy or too hard and they need to be adjusted uh, in difficulty level or type. Uh, another reason might be that the environment that they're trying to be doing the homework in might not be conducive uh, for doing homework. And so you might need to, to dig into that and, and kind of change uh, what type of environment they're working in. Maybe they need to go to a library or go into a, a quiet room in their house. So um, another reason could be that they need additional cues or additional support or reminders to be doing the homework. So all of these questions can help reveal and help, help you and the client problem solve a little bit in, um, about you know, what, what could be done differently to make them more successful. The fourth factor is cost effectiveness. And we talked about one study that looked at cost effectiveness, and they found that the pro rata cost of treatment for the computer and group therapy was 30% um, cheaper than the standard service of care. 
Uh, this area certainly needs more research, but another study that did look at cost effectiveness was by Palmer et al. And here's a quote from their article. They said, considering the additional gains the experimental group made compared to the control group, the technology-based rehabilitation was considered to be quite cost effective. So as we consider this last factor in our clinical practice, you as a clinician can help the client weigh the costs versus the benefits. We talked about several benefits here. Um, one is more opportunity to practice. With these technology-based programs, it can be very accessible and flexible, and many programs do have customer support. Um, some programs allow you to stay connected to the client and see what they've done. Uh, and then as you're making these considerations, you also want to think about, you know, how realistic is it that this individual is going to be actually using the program and how does that compare to a copay? When you consider the cost of the program, there are many free programs out there. However, you do often get what you pay for. Um, so those programs might not be evidence-based. Other programs have a one-time payment and others have a subscription, so kind of weighing and, and, and discussing that with, with the client as well. And so, of course, you want to consider the barriers as well. And one very real barrier is the client's budget. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of things that I might recommend you investigate. One might be to contact that company or technology because some all do offer subsidies or scholarships. The, the program might also be covered by an insurance or even an FSA or an HSA, so there might be some different things that you can investigate as well. So this course was originally a live webinar event, and so there's a few questions that came up from that event that I wanted to mention here. The first question is, many patients don't have devices, any ideas? So there's, there's many uh, solutions that you might try. If this person has a family member that has a phone or a tablet, that might be a good short-term solution to at least try out the programs and see if it's a good fit for them. Another idea is that some programs provide tablets for you. So you might contact that company or technology and see what options they have, uh, whether it's to loan or to keep the tablet as well. There's also some government programs that can lend out tablets. For example, in New York, uh, there is a trade program where they actually lend out iPads to people with acquired brain injury so that they can access programs like these. Many of the clients are elderly and are resistant to using technology. What do you suggest to encourage them? So yes, we definitely hear that. Um, as technology becomes more prevalent, we're seeing it less and less, but certainly uh, comfort level of technology is an important thing and it, it can be very intimidating to get started with something that you're not very comfortable or familiar with. So one suggestion is to slowly incorporate the technology into your therapy sessions um, before recommending anything outside of the, the therapy. Uh, perhaps you intermingle it uh, in between um, some paper-based exercises, and that way you can kind of show them, you know, it is similar, it's, it's the same types of exercises, but there's so much more we can do with this type of technology. Look at the immediate feedback you're getting, look how I can change the difficulty level on the spot, and look how there's unlimited items. You're not limited to the finite number of, of, of items on a worksheet. So that might be one way to kind of encourage and, and slowly introduce it. And uh, we, we hear from clinicians uh, stories about how they broke down the barrier to resistance. Uh, sometimes if a person has strong family support, that can be a really good way to help uh, bridge the practice at home. There was one clinician who said she worked with a nine-year-old who um, never used technology but grew to really like it because it was something that him and his son could do together. And there was another clinician that talked about um, how their elderly client really enjoyed uh, sitting at the kitchen table with his grandkid and uh, they would do their homework together. So it was kind of like a very fun bonding time where they were both working on their, their, their homework at the same time. How does technology work with generalization? So that's a great question. And you see, even in the research, it can be very challenging to measure generalization. 
And one reason why is that you don't live in a vacuum. So um, if you're if you're working on a technology-based program, you might also be doing a number of other different things uh, to be working on your skills, whether it's going to a social group or you know interacting with your friends or your family members or you know practicing other types of strategies or getting therapy as well. Um, so it, it can be hard to to measure. Um, directly the, that generalization, but you know, as the clinician, our role is to educate the the client on how working on a skill or or an exercise can generalize into your daily practice. So, if you're doing very functional tasks on the the technology program, uh, whether it's some things like calculating tip or talking about a picture or um, you know following instructions you know showing that that's something that you're also doing in your daily life and this is one kind of structured way to be working on it but you want to be applying you know the strategies that are making you feel very successful within that digital program to events in your daily life many patients are low income what can they do if they can't afford a program so we touched on this from a previous slide but there are many solutions that you might want to look into. One might be looking to see if it can be covered by insurance. Another is contacting that company or that technology and seeing what solutions that they might have. For example, with the Constant Therapy app, uh, there are scholarships. So if someone is unable to afford the, the full amount, you know, the, the company will work with that person to see what they're able to do. The last question was, what are some ideas for addressing barriers for people who won't do homework? So again, not doing homework can be multifactorial and there could be many reasons why they're not doing the homework. Um, one issue might be that, that they forget that there is homework. So doing some sort of external compensation like writing it in a planner, setting a timer or an alarm or a calendar alert, or even having a family member um, kind of cue them to remind them that they need to be doing it. Another barrier might be that person's schedule. So they might want to really do a lot of the homework, but their schedule doesn't actually allow it. And so they're kind of setting themselves up for failure. So taking a look at what they're actually doing in their day. Their day might be very full with other therapies or other commitments, and you might need to scale back the, th the homework goal a little bit to make it fit their schedule and make it more realistic for them as well. Another barrier might be that they don't really understand the, the value of it, and so it might go back to you know, that rationale building, perhaps if they're, um, you know, interested in, in reading about homework or reading about neuroplasticity or practice, providing them with some, some research articles or some other ways that they can kind of learn, you know, why, why are we assigning this and why is it so important that you're doing it? And then another factor, and we see this a lot in a cognitive profile, is decreased initiation. And so one solution might be that this person could have a homework buddy uh, where they you know, sit down and do the homework together, whether that's a friend or a family member. Another option is something called the Pomodoro technique. And so that's where you just set the timer for 10 minutes and you tell yourself you're gonna do this work for 10 minutes. And when the timer goes off, if I'm still not in my flow and I'm not, I'm not feeling the homework, then I get to stop. Uh, but usually once once 10 minutes go by, then you've kind of gotten to set and you're, you're in the flow and you're okay with working longer than that. So those were some of the questions from the live event. And of course, we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you do have any additional questions, you can either email me or you can ask them in the course of Val as well. And so as we wrap up, I wanna leave you with this quote. The author said, the ideal rehabilitation program provides a personalized rehabilitation plan that offers a step in the journey towards greater independence by empowering the individual towards being more engaged and integrated in their own care. The integration of technology-based rehabilitation may allow this goal to become a reality for individuals with acquired brain injury. So I wanna sincerely thank you for your time today and for joining the webinar. And I'd love to hear your feedback as well. So please complete the course evaluation where you can provide feedback about today's webinar as well as what you'd like to learn in the future. And we'll, we'll definitely take that into consideration as we're creating new courses for you. 
So thank you and I hope you have a great day.